Uh, did I pronounce that right? Close enough. Dr. Olivia Todu. There we go. Yeah. Um, who is that? Is the mic on at this point? Yes. Thank you, James. So, yes, uh, you said this already. I guess there are two more things maybe you can see on the slide. Uh, the first one is I thought really, really hard about the right keywords to pair with serverless, right? And after really this long conversation with myself, I decided there was serverless days, so probably serverless was the best choice. The second thing is, you know, in contrast with the keynote speakers, I didn't really have a budget for colors or fancy fonts or, you know, fire animations, these kind of things. So bear with me. So simple outline for the talk today. You know, we're going to talk about serverless composition. Why and how? Why is why do I care? But more importantly, why should you care, right? And then quite a bit about the how. Uh, we've heard a lot about functions as a service already, so that's good. I don't have to spend too much time on that. You know, in short, let's say this is a, a, a service to run functions in response to events. That has lots of, you know, that's the next evolution that has lots of benefits compared to what you've used before, VMs, containers, you name it, right? So again, Erika uh, went through a lot of that. Uh, so there's no setup, really. Uh, you get auto-provisioning, auto-scaling, quick response time. Definitely, you know, the, 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 the uh, cold starts, maybe not. But after things are warm, you get much, much response time compared to containers. Uh, the, you don't pay very much for it, uh, even driven. One thing I really like about this is also the, the freedom and the community, right? There are lots of different vendors, lots of different platform, open source software stacks, lots, lots to choose from, and lots of, you know, smart people to talk to, you know, and interact with. So let me show you concretely what it means. So in this talk, I'm primarily going to rely on the OpenWiz platform, the one I'm working on. But pretty much everything I'm going to say, you can transport to the platform you, uh, of, your, of your choosing, right? So a function is just that. It's a function. And what we mean by no sim setup, by simple, by all of that, is that it really takes one line to take this function and, and deploy it to the cloud. And once it's deployed to the cloud, you can run it. So again, it takes one line or a few clicks in the UI if you rather do that. And then you can run your functions. You know, of course, what's confusing with OpenWhisk is we like to call functions actions, you know, because we were there you know, before, I guess, maybe. Right. So running functions on demand, of course, is not you know, that thing. So we support some kind of events. We call them triggers. Uh, we support, you know, think of them as event sources. We support connecting event sources to functions, we call that rules. And what that means, for instance, is I could create a trigger uh, with something like that. Here I'm doing something a little bit fancy because I'm not just creating an event, but I'm creating the source for these events. It's a periodic thing that will periodically create events. Again, details don't matter. Um, I can then connect my event source to my event handler, and that's it. I have already something running on the cloud. And you know, if it fires every two minutes or something like that, every two minutes I will pay a tiny amount of money for that thing's running, right? And it's much, much better than you know, anything prior, right? And so again, we've seen something like that before. Uh, you know, there are lots of uh, 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 talks, lots of graphs, lots of people on the internet have explained this. You know, it's ra really raising the level of abstraction, starting from infrastructure as a service, containers as a service, platform as a service, and now functions. And you know, I chose you know I chose this particular graph from this blog post that I enjoyed reading uh, a, a while ago, because I think in contrast with many of these uh, illustrations you find on the internet, it's a bit more honest, right? It's 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 actually telling you something more. It's not just raising level abstraction, but something's happening to the right, right? We started from blue, green, gray. Blue is what the cloud provider does. Green is really what, you know, where you start having to do things. And something happened with FAST, something we don't quite understand yet, is you know, there was a leak, right? That gray you know, started uh, leaking below what we say is the level at which you need to think, right? And one way to think about this is that as we raise the level of abstraction in all these platforms, at some point we intersected what you really care about as a user of the cloud. You care about your applications. You care about the solutions you're developing. And so what could it possibly mean that we're actually concerned with things that are above the level of abstraction that, of the thing that you really care about? Well, it means we have a problem. And it means maybe we went too far. Right? And so that's what I'd like to address in this talk. So, um, 
I've shown you this before, and you know, if you were really paying attention, maybe you've seen that all of the benefits were on the left of the slide, right? And that maybe suggests that something bad is going to happen at this point, right? And indeed, we've also heard a lot about that before. Essentially, you're getting all these benefits uh, with the fast platform, but there are some strings attached. You know, things should be short, they should be simple, they should be stateless. You know, and this is enforced, right? This is not something you can, well, you can play with it. We've heard lots of things about, you know, how it's not really true. Maybe you can, you know, work around. Maybe you have eight hours, you know, all kinds of things. But essentially, you have these constraints. And what that means is that today, I think fast, in particular serverless, maybe in general, is still perceived as something that is as relatively narrow, that works well for certain kind of applications. And, and beyond that, we don't really know. So I think it's, if I would take a poll in this room, probably not, because we're all, you know, been converted, right? We all believe in serverless. We all understand it's going to go beyond that. But outside of this room, maybe there's still this prejudice that, you know, you can use serverless for simple things, and otherwise you should really use the other things. So what I'd like to do today is to try to convince you uh, that indeed it's not the case. We, can, we, we are going to do more with serverless and start thinking about how we are going to do more with serverless. And one way I'd like to start with that is to actually go back in time and, and say what, what happened before the cloud, right? And probably before the cloud, I would guess again, a lot of you write code or did at some point in your life. And so you probably had a class at some point in your life about coding, maybe your first one. If, was more like me, it was Pascal at the time, right? I'm that old, I guess. But, you know, whether it's C, Java, it doesn't matter. You probably learned in, that, in these first few classes that you should write functions. And functions should be small, simple, and stateless, right? And the words were probably different, so I suspect they weren't saying stateless at the time. They were saying things like, please separate your code from your data structure. But when you think about it, it's really saying the same thing, right? So, how come this is a problem with serverless, and whereas this is the greatest thing for you know, the old ways of doing things? Uh, well, it's because there was this class, and maybe there was the next class, right? You know where I'm going, right? Is that, yes, you start with small and simple functions, but then you put them together. And you know, start with the bricks, you build the walls, you build the houses, you build the churches, maybe the cathedrals, and it's great. We were so excited about this, that we actually even coined a name for that. We call that software engineering, right? So what this is just telling us is maybe we're missing components here with serverless, something we have to think about, right? And so another way to think about it, again, going to the, to the picture, is that you know, when we raise this level of abstraction here, maybe we have to be a little bit more careful about what we mean here. What we mean is, as an as application developer, I, I need to specify what's my business logic. I need to explain what I want to do with my application. But I like as much as possible everything else to be taken care of by the platform. So of course I call this composition, so the platform should be the conductor for my composition. So some people complain that my you know, musical terminology sucks, so you can think of this as workflow and workflow orchestration engine maybe, if that's uh, the way you like to think about that. So, um, the developer should truly focus on you know, the high-value business logic, and the platform should do the rest. So think of this as handling scheduling and handling communication. Again, if I go back to the old world where we were writing functions, uh, how often do you worry about calling conventions? Probably not that much, right? You let the compiler, you let the runtime do that. So we have the exact same problem here. If we have, you're writing microservices today or you know, using PaaS, you probably worry about APIs, the REST APIs, the protocols, all of that. What we're trying to do with functions is to take that away, to say that should just magically work, right? The platform should do that, and you should focus on what you really care about. OK, so hopefully, by now, I convince you that you know, there's something interesting going on here. And this is the outline for the rest of the talk. I'm just going to give you just a little bit of background about OpenWhisk. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the simplest possible form of composition, which is the sequence. Essentially, I'm going to try to tell you that you might have done this before. If you've done this before, you probably did it wrong, right? And, and then I'm going to talk about the uh, composition framework we're working on at IBM, which is called Composer. And then because you probably, uh, you know, care about what the rest of the world is doing, I'm going to try to talk about uh, uh, what everybody else is doing. <laughs> 
So, on this slide, so just, just to be clear, right? Today I'm talking about OpenWhisk, which is uh, an open source software stack for doing FAST. It's a collaboration, so it's under an Apache umbrella. It's now a collaboration with lots of different people and companies. And IBM Cloud Functions happens to be a managed platform based on that. So uh, the reason you care probably in this talk is because it has a free tier, so you can get an account and you can run the things I'm showing you in the talk without having to worry about deploying Apache OpenWhisk. But Apache OpenWhisk is by far not limited to IBM. And you know, later on, I'm going to talk about Composer. And, and this is also a link if you care about knowing more about this. OK, so sequences. Why, again? Simplest form of composition. Why do we care? Well, here's a simple example, for instance. I want to build an application that translates a piece of text in an unknown language to English so that I can read it. So if I look at what IBM provides on its cloud as API to do these kind of things, well, they provide two. They provide one, it's called translator, that takes a piece of text, an input language, an output language, and translate from the input language to the output language. But this is not really what I want to do. I don't know the input language. So we also have another API that, given a piece of text, will try to figure out the language of that piece of text. So if I want to build my application, I need to compose these two. I need to call the first one to know the input language to the second one. And again, I don't have much time, but I'd like to show you there are lots of possible ways to do that already with any fast platform today, right? And let's see what goes wrong if you try to do that. So the first idea, of course, is to say, OK, I have these two functions. I'm building an application. Let's, let's put some code in the client to do this composition, right? So there's some boilerplate code that has to do with OpenWhisk. You don't really care about it. It's just meant to make the syntax of the, the black uh, two lines of code at the bottom a little bit easier to read. But essentially, my composition says, please call the first function on some parameters, the input text. Then let's get the result of that. And uh, now let's invoke, invoke translator on the result of that, right? Very, very simple, works, right? There's only one problem with that, one tiny problem. It's not serverless at all, right? If I want to do this application 10 times, I will have 10 clients. 10 of them will have the same kind of composition in them, the same kind of sequence. And if I happen to want to change this sequence, for instance, I will have to change the 10 different applications. This is the opposite of what we want to do with microservices. Right? Microservices, I want to take these two microservices and build a third microservice that is obtained by composing the first two. Right? One concrete uh, drawback of this approach in particular is I have two round trips to the cloud. Right? I'm going to the cloud to get the language, and I'm coming back to my cell phone maybe with a pretty you know, busy uh, uh, Wi-Fi because you're all here. Right? And then I need to go back to the cloud and get the translation and come back. So you know, possible, you can do that. It works in some cases, but it's less than ideal. We'd like to do better than that. So of course, I think the next logical thing to try is to say, let's move that to the cloud. Right? We have functions. So let's slap this in, you know, function main around that, like make this uh, a, a function that compose function, and let's run that. So it's better now, right? Because now this is running in the cloud. You know, I have the client, it does one request. I, I, I did build a microservice that is the composition of the, of, the, of the earlier two. There's just one tiny annoying problem with that. Is now I have three functions, and they kind of run in parallel, which means that the provider is actually billing me for the three functions. Right? And one of these functions, to stay on the you know, uh, musical analogy, my daughter would say, one of these functions is la 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 la. It's doing nothing. It's just waiting on the other two. So that's not really good. That's especially not good when you realize that I want to build functions on top of functions, on top of functions, on top of functions. So I'm going to be built three times, four times, five times. Now, however deep I need my compositions to be. So again, kind of works. Probably not the end of the story. So what else could we try? We could try to instead fuse our functions. Right? I have these two things. Let's get the code for these two functions, slap them in one big file or zip file, and let's just call them using JavaScript right, to do that. So now it's much better in a sense because I no longer have this, you know, I no longer have this double cost. I no longer have the issue that the composition is done on the client. You know, it looks better in many ways. In some cases, it actually works. The problem is I'm making a lot of assumptions here. For instance, here I'm assuming that I have access to the code of these two things, so the credentials, right? And I can actually build a function that compose the other two by, by copying and pasting, let's say. 
And that works in some cases, but that doesn't work if you're calling external APIs. So for instance, if you're actually using Watson services to do this translation, you cannot do that. Right? So that's a, that's a solution. All the, you know, all the nice properties, except it's a special case, only works if the conditions are right. OK, so let me, uh, and one of the things, for instance, I was doing this in JavaScript is, you know, I was assuming that then these two functions were expressed in JavaScript in the first place, or I would have to port them to JavaScript or some common language so I can integrate them in that way. Let's try one last thing, maybe. We have events, right? I, not, I don't have time to talk much about events, but we have events in this platform. So maybe one better thing we can do is to say, let's wrap the first function, the language ID function, and at the end of the execution of this function, rather than directly invoking the other function, let me post to a queue, hey, this is the result of what I've obtained, and that let the system, let the event and platform manage that. So I would create uh, a tree, I would create an, a queue, essentially, the trigger, and I would connect this trigger to the second function, which is the translator function, and then my function would become this, right? And then the picture will be that. So does that work? Yes, that works, because I'm not, you know, I'm solving the problems I talked about before. I don't really need any special things about these functions, uh, any special rights about these functions. I don't pay twice. This is running on the server. Still, I broke something. Right? I broke something that you may care about or may not, but in some cases we care about that. The thing I broke is the orange thing here. The thing I broke is when I call this function, this composition, now it's not going to return to me, if I do a blocking call, it's not going to return to me the translated text. It's going to return to me, I've successfully posted the next step of your composition to a queue. Right? And that means if, as a client, I care about the translated text, which I probably do, otherwise I wouldn't do, be doing all of that, then I have in the client to walk through some stuff. You know, I have to have a more complex way of invoking my API so that I can eventually get the result of the second function as opposed to the result of the first one. Right? So again, fail. Right? We tried. We tried many different things. And without any help somehow from the platform, it looks like this is not going to work very well, or it's going to work in some cases, but not all of them. Right? So I don't have time to prove that it will always fail, or don't have time to prove that we have a fundamental issue there. We actually have an academic paper in the conference with some colleagues where we try to advocate that, you know, to explain that in more details. But I like, you know, you to uh, be somewhat convinced at this point that there's something tricky here, right? And if you look at the OpenWIS platform, and again, I'll talk about other platforms in a minute, we've identified this problem two or three years ago, I think. Marcus, correct me if I'm wrong. And we decided, yes, sequence seems to be pretty fundamental stuff. Uh, if you do it by hand, you do it wrong. So let, let's, let's just support that in our runtime. And we created something, we call it a sequence. And you define it in one comment, and you invoke it like any other function. In particular, you can pass the minus r if you're using the command line here to say, please give me the result. And the result is the real result, is the translated text, not the intermediate result I couldn't care less about. And it solved all of the problems I've talked about. This is just yet another problem. The problem is I built something magical. It works for sequences, but maybe I want to do more than sequences, right? So, so what are we going to do about that? So in the context of OpenWays, we're going to talk about Composer. Others are doing similar things. I'll, I'll get to that. And I want to show you just a little bit more, here again, because I think that's the best way to do it, of course, what we're doing for Composer. So first, I'd like to go back to our uh, my, my, my Hello World application, which was the translation, and tell you, not only, you know, I wasn't working, but I was actually cheating a little bit. I was making this application a bit simpler than it is in practice, right? So for at least a couple of reasons. The first reason is the language ID thing returns the language, but that's not exactly what I need for the translator. For the translator, I need to say what I'm translating from, what I'm translating to, and, you know, what I'm translating, right? So that means, between these two calls to language ID and translator, I need to do a little bit of shuffling on my data to say, you know, the output of the first function is actually the translate from input for the next one. So it's a slightly more complex sequence. And, you know, maybe I could have a function for that, but it seems like a very special thing I'm doing just for connecting these two functions. So maybe I just like to do that in my composition without having to name it independently, deploy it independently, etc. The second thing is, of course, I can say 42, 
right? What's the language of 42? Well, not, not really clear, right? So what the API is going to do in that case is say, I don't know, except that it's a computer-based API. So it's going to give you a weird error code, right? And if you care about doing that for users, you probably want to take this weird error code and translate it into something that, the user, that will mean something to the, to the user. So for instance, you might want to say cannot identify language. So what I'm getting at here very quickly is that, of course, it's just like coding, just like programming in general. You know, sequence is a very important part of structured programming, let's say, but there are other things. There's, you know, loops, there's a conditional, there are structural error handling, you name it, right? And we need these kind of things if we want to build real function composition, whether they're serverless or not. And so that's what we're getting at. The other thing I, I, I don't really have time to go into there is that this code starts getting uh, harder to read. We understand that, and so we like to give you nice uh, visualization of that code, for instance. So, yes, so we have a, a tool called Shell that can take this code and do lots of great things with it. In particular, show you the visualization of the right, which is interactive, can be used for tracing, for all kinds of good things. Um, so, so our solution for this problem is essentially threefold, right? The first component of that is the composer component I talked about. I'll talk a little bit more about. Right now, it's a JavaScript library to build this composition. The code in the previous slide was JavaScript. But you could, I mean, we're, doing, we're working on doing the same thing in Python, for instance. This is coming up shortly. So the second thing is conductor, the piece in the runtime that helps run these things. The good news about it is that you don't have to know about it. It's the same usual serverless story. You know, it's there. We worked hard. And then you get the magic for free. And the third thing is we think tooling is really important, and we have this tool, and I have just two screen captures of that tool that show you, yes, you can build more complex applications. You can see dynamic traces of what happened in your application. You can see statistics of whether you're going left or right. You can see you know, timing diagrams, lot, lot, lots, lots of cool stuff. Um, so going back to the basics composition, essentially what we've tried to do here is build a kind of a Turing complete, basic programming language, impressive. It's a mix of impressive and data flow because essentially, the, what, just like what I had in sequence, the output of a, an element of the sequence is normally the input of the next. So it's kind of a hybrid thing. We also don't think people really like new programming languages. Uh, they'd rather use libraries. So this is a library, but you could make these languages if you wanted to. And the other uh, last interesting thing, again, to say about this, I guess, is when you look at this, except maybe for the second line where I talk about inline function, there's not, no clue that tells you which language it's in. Right? So you can do the same thing with your favorite language. And in serverless, we strongly believe in having support for many different languages. Uh, we had a PHP or lots of, you know, last week in OpenWhisk, we had somebody uh, propose a ballerina. A runtime for OpenWhisk, which I think is really, really cool and actually really related to that. And, and, and that's about it. That's about what I want to say about this, except for one last slide, um, because so far, especially what's in open source, is still a little bit of a toy. But I want to tell you we want to do much more with that. And so, for instance, we're working with people at the weather company to redo a lot of their APIs. Uh, using this kind of uh, platform, you know, the serverless platform and this kind of technology to, to build the APIs. And so here's a snippet of code that comes from one of their simplest thing, which is a flu API. It's something that takes, uh, uh, you know, uh, data from the center of disease control and uh, get fetch the data, message the data, does some processing of the data, and then does the produce some results that then can be queried. And so it starts, so you know, compared to the previous slide, it has things like uh, including you know, HTTP requests, including talking to a database. So Composer has a plugin architecture when you can add these kind of things. It also has map, which means there's, there's concurrency going on here. So here we process time periods in parallel. Within the time peri period, we process states in parallel. All kinds of interesting stuff coming. Good. So as promised, uh, I have a few minutes, and I'd like to talk about, you know, I think this is a great idea, and as often with great ideas, we're not the only one having the idea, right? We may not even be the first, right? So now I still have to pause for one second because I need a disclaimer, of course. My employer, IBM, is, doesn't like it when we go on stage and we talk about what essentially competitors are doing. So they want me to remind you that everything I'm going to say doesn't matter, 
right? It's, on, it's only vaguely my opinion, you know, of course it tries to be unbiased and uh, to the best of my knowledge, but it has no pretense of being exhaustive, exact, anything like that. Right, so, and to start with, I've, you know, just selected a few things to show you, but there are more uh, out there. So here I have five things uh, in alphabetical order, AWS, Huawei, Microsoft, Oracle, and Platform 9. And, you know, again, they are very uncomfortable having me writing down things, so I'm just having pictures here. So let's start with AWS. So AWS, as usual, was the pioneer in that field. They invented Lambda, then they invented Step Functions, which is essentially a framework for composing functions, right? And so what's interesting with what they've done is they they, they, they provide not just visualization tools, but really they provide tools where you can uh, draw your compositions and you can uh, graphically tackle your composition. So I think that's very interesting. I think the mindset they've, they've been doing this in is look at some key patterns like error recovery and let's support those well and this brings a lot of value. I think in contrast, for instance, with what we're doing, I'm not sure they, they attempt to be universal. They, they, the intent is for composition to get very, very large, right? Uh, Composer and a lot of the other frameworks I'm going to talk about uh, maybe, uh, you know, are more text-based and, 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 and more amenable to version control, these kind of things. So that being said, of course, Amazon has a textual representation for this. It's a JSON format. It's called the Amazon State Language. You can look into it. You can generate it in many different ways, but you probably don't write, want to write it by hand. Um, Huawei is doing very impressive work. Uh, uh, maybe you're less familiar. I think they're uh, focused on China a lot. Um, uh, to start with, it looks a bit like uh, the Amazon state language. So you're writing JSON. Your JSON describes state machines again, transitions. Uh, what's, I think, the most interesting, the, the most fascinating thing, I think, with uh, Huawei is thinking very hard about how to integrate and better integrate events into this. So this example maybe doesn't show that. But that's, that's something that's really important for compositions. I mean, I talked about composition. I talked a lot about the compute aspect of the composition. But there's also the event aspect of the composition. What if you want an application that waits for an event in the middle, for instance? I think they're thinking hard about that. They have a similar approach to giving you toolings to visualize what's going on, test things, etc. Microsoft is doing, of course, uh, a very interesting work on that. Uh, I think a bit like us, they're worried about developers who write code that they're primary targets. So this is the kind of code. So they have something called durable functions. This is the kind of things that you can write about. It's one thing they worry a lot about. We haven't worried so much about is uh, fault tolerance or resilience. So the Microsoft way of approaching things is if you describe a composition, if any step of your composition fails, they are going to retry it automatically for you and resume, that means there are some constraints or there are some limitations. I mean, it's not, as far as I've said so far, officially, it's not meant to run very long-running things, whereas something I might have said earlier with AWS is that you can have uh, very many steps you can uh, run for a very long time. That, I think, is, is tackling a slightly different uh, application domain. Uh, Oracle is working on it. Uh, uh, I don't have much to say about Oracle because they don't have yet, uh, I think, an official, uh, you know, service available. I think it's planned for 2000 something or maybe end, end of 2018, I don't remember. They also uh, talk a lot about how you're going to monitor, how you're going to um, uh, visualize these things, which I think is a really important topic. The last platform I want to talk about is Platform 9. Yes, I'm running out of time. Uh, they have a YAML-based approach, so it's also a finest state machine approach to describing things. You write the YAML, uh, you can get visualizations for that, and you can describe your workflows in that way. I think it's also a very interesting piece of work. Okay, so my point there was not too much to say this is good or bad or anything, but my point was to say, look, there's a lot going on. Uh, I encourage you to try Composer to think about compositions, but you can, I'm sure in the, your choice of platforms you can find interesting thing to try. The other thing I'd, I'd like to point out is there's lots of design decisions here to be made, and, oops. <laughs> and they go, can go in very different ways, right? You can, you know, some of these teams and platforms have, have chosen to emphasize the graphical, you know, uh, design languages as opposed to textual ones. 
Uh, Microsoft and I are thinking that high-level language are better than just JSON and YAML, but there's also value to JSON and YAML. Uh, lots of discussions to have about uh, what you can really express with this composition. So I don't want you to take the wrong message here. You've seen the previous talk, for instance. It was all about composing, say, one function with the rest of the application. So composing functions is important, but again, you want to compose functions with services, right? And so I've shown you a little bit of that in the TWC, in the weather company example. Events are important, different choices about resilience, there's a cost. There are different trade-offs to be made here. Lots of things. OK, and I'm out of time, so as a conclusion, I like to say this is both a natural evolution, but at the same, the new exciting frontier, lots of things coming up. I think the really key here is that it's going to make serverless much more powerful in the near future and go compose. Thank you.